Good morning, everyone. We're taking a live look this morning in Dublin, Ireland right now. It's about lunchtime. Check that out. Just hours ahead of the big St. Patrick's Day holiday over there. It looks like a movie set. It's so springy and lovely. Love seeing that photo. See what's happening on the other side of the world. It's nice. We are celebrating the luck of the Irish this week, two years after the COVID pandemic began. The changes you can expect at your favorite establishments, all the way to some studies about consuming too much alcohol. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning here on the Morning Medical Update, which starts right now. And another good morning to you. It is Tuesday, March 15th. Welcome into the Morning Medical Update. Thank you so much for joining us here on Facebook, on YouTube, and now on Twitter. The medical news headlines this morning for you. A new study out of the University of Georgia found the cost of fungal infections in the U.S. reached nearly $7 billion. This was back in 2018. Those included everything from issues affecting the respiratory system to the bloodstream. Researchers now fear with more infections and more antibiotics being prescribed, it will lead to more cases of antibiotic resistance. TikTok users seeking deep tans are using a questionable method, spraying self-tanning products up their noses and then lying in the sun or in a tanning bed. No, no, and no across the board there is what I'm guessing. The main ingredient in self-tanning products is dihydroxyacetone or DHA. It is FDA approved for the use of the skin. It causes a chemical reaction when it heats and it's applied and then pigments your skin. Dermatologists around the world are warning people not to do this. Um, you could become sick and throw up and all sorts of bad things could happen. Okay, forget the green beer this St. Patrick's Day. There's now a blue adult beverage you might want to indulge in. It is made by Hoppy Urban Brew based in France. The beer called Line is made with a blue green algae. The makers say this is a healthy beer because it only has 3% alcohol and the blue green algae is packed with protein and rich in vitamins along with some antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties that can help strengthen the immune system. And for many, the Irish holiday started this past weekend. The city of Overmoan Park held its first ever St. Patrick's Day Parade this past Saturday. Lots of people out, lots of green, marching through downtown OP. There were uh, balloons, floats, kids, people, and sunshine. So a lot of people enjoying that this week. It's nice to see, finally. Get your questions sent in to us today on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. So get those in. But now, yeah. let's get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. I know this is not your lane, but the whole suntan yeah. stuff up the nose. I was going to talk about that. Hard no? Hard no. You okay. know, I, I think we, we've seen this all over now. Um, just a lot of people thinking they have good ideas about certain medications and how to use them. Um, using uh, skin products and inhaling it or squirting it up your nose is a no-no. We know there can be side effects. Uh, this doesn't just go to that. This goes to a lot of different products when general population just thinks that they can use them in any sort of manner they want. Um, that is not true. We know there can be extremely harmful effects, and so I think uh, this is just one more case of that. Yet we know what is safe, and we were talking about this right before the show started. The vaccinations are safe, uh, but yet there's a reticence to do that. So I think, um, you know, we just keep getting that message out there. And yes, if there is a product for your skin, please do not ingest it or inhale it. Um, it's, it's made to be topical. So, Good tip. Yeah. Do we do? Do we get do numbers this morning? Sorry, I was looking down at my notes. Do we get to the numbers? Uh, I will. Okay. Just a minute, yeah. So we have uh, 12 active infections. So uh, down a little bit. We have been hanging in those high teens. Uh, again, seeing less is is always better. Of those 12, zero in the ICU, zero on the ventilator, 64 in that recovery period as well. So just um, overall. Uh, we are continuing to see better numbers in the hospital, overall better numbers in the community as well. I'd like to see zero down the line yeah, right there. That will absolutely. be a, a very nice day. All right, do we have any reporter questions on the line today? Okay, I have got one here. This is from Fox mm -hmm. 4. Um, quick question, uh, Dr. Hawkinson, and I want to bring in Dr. Matt Shoemaker as well. Yeah. What do docs, the docs think about um, the Pfizer CEO saying that a fourth booster dose will be, quote, necessary, mm -hmm. that it will be an absolute must. Is there anything that people should know at this point um, yeah. regarding the studies in this area? Are they ongoing? Mm -hmm. Any advice you have for people? Should they just get the shot or hold off? Yeah, I'll defer uh, to Dr. Shoemaker uh, after I answer, but I think we both certainly want to see the data. I think we have to understand where this uh, quote is coming from. We know it's the CEO of Pfizer. We know they have done a great 
service to humanity with their vaccines as well as Moderna, these mRNA vaccines, really proven to be very, uh, very helpful and protective. Also, uh, Johnson & Johnson. So the vaccines, we know they continue to protect against hospitalization, severe disease, and death, and that is really why they were created. Uh, I think he even said that in the story. Um, the other thing we have to understand is why are we looking to get a new vaccine? Is it to boost our antibodies? Uh, because we know if you have higher levels of antibodies, you have less risk of infection. But we know that those antibodies decrease or those antibodies contract after you get further out from those dose of anti, uh, that, that dose of vaccine. So I think the big driver of what we are going to see on if uh, additional dosing is needed, say six to 12 months after that booster dose. So again, that's the third dose if you are not immunocompromised. And that's the fourth dose if you're immunocompromised. I think we're gonna see uh, the, hopefully see the data to understand, are we still getting protection from going to the hospital, going to the ICU and dying. We just don't have the data now. We certainly wanna look for that. I think we are looking to Israel first because we know they had large numbers of their populations that were getting fourth dose. Um, I'm sure there will be data from other countries as well. And I think we really just wanna see and understand uh, the data about that. In addition, we also have to understand that during this time, well, people will also have been infected and so they will gain some immunity from that as well. We've always said, however, vaccines and vaccination is the safest way to gain that immunity. But then when you have infection in there as well, we know you're gaining uh, immune responses to those other parts of the virus that we don't see on the vaccine. So I think the bottom line is we have to wait and see what the data shows us. And if there is, it may be just for certain populations, uh, but I think we are still waiting for all that. And I'll kind of defer to Dr. Shoemaker. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Hawkins. And I, uh, the vaccine is very safe. I think a fourth dose, uh, there's no downside to it, but we really need to see the data. Um, we're not sure with decreasing antibodies what that means as far as protection because you have to take into account your, your memory T cells and what they may be able to do if re-exposed. I think the most important thing at this point as opposed to worrying about a fourth dose is ensuring that we get everybody vaccinated, including boosted, that is unvaccinated at this point. But it's okay, right? It's safe. It is safe. It's yeah, a very safe absolutely. vaccine. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right, we're going to scooch Hi, guys. On. Good morning. I have one. Hey. All right. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Hi, guys. It's Taylor, Channel 41. Good morning. Hi. Hi. It's been a minute. Um, wanted to ask about, we, we had a report this morning about the rising cases in China again, mm -hmm. uh, that they're experiencing uh, some of the highest cases uh, and, and deaths that they've had since the beginning of the pandemic. Do you know anything about that? Is that a new strain that people need to be aware of? What can you tell us about what's going on in China right now? Yeah, the only thing I'm aware of is that it's probably Omicron. I haven't heard that it's a new variant or anything like that. We know Hong Kong is being decimated right now. A lot of those problems come from elderly, elderly populations and nursing home populations that aren't fully vaccinated. And that is um, still a mystery to me. We know China um, has taken a zero COVID stance um, so we know that is playing a part now is now they have overwhelming infections. There certainly are a lot of factors that go into this, but yeah, we know that China uh, is experiencing outbreaks in a lot of their cities. We saw one, one story that an Apple supplier has to be shut down because the city is in lockdown for a couple weeks. We know again, Hong Kong right now is being devastated as well. Um, I think there, again, there's a multitude of factors First of all, being uh, the trying for that zero COVID stance where they don't have a lot of natural immunity that has been gained or some population immunity. Also lack of vaccinations, especially for those high risk populations like the elderly. So I think there are a number of different conversation uh, 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 factors that go into that. But we know um, we just have to wait and see what happens with China as a whole. And of course, Hong Kong, and hopefully they are able to come out of that uh, sometime soon with not too much uh, not too much more loss of life. But I think it's going to be important to get everybody in those countries, in every country, really vaccinated and get those vaccines to those those underserved countries as well. Dr. Shoemaker, your comments? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't really have anything additional to add uh, to that. I think part of it could be uh, as we wane on into the second year, people getting a little uh, more lax with their uh, masking, social distancing and hand hygiene practices may play a part as well.
Right, Dr. Matt Shoemaker is an infectious disease doctor here at our health system. I just wanted to officially introduce you to the program. And Dr. Richard Dubinsky, a neurologist here, we're gonna talk about the effects of drinking on the brain this morning. You're gonna help us understand what's happening and what's going on up there when we, we drink a little too much. So get ready to wear and also spend the green this St. Patrick's Day. New numbers from the National Retail Federation finds that 54% of us plan to celebrate the Irish holiday, spending roughly $43 a piece. So how will we celebrate? Most will wear green while others will pack their favorite Irish bar or restaurant, go to or host a party, or go out and watch or participate in the parades. So with masks no longer <clears throat> on anymore. Uh, what can you do to keep you and your family safe from COVID and other viruses out there? So Matt Shoemaker is going to talk a little bit about that. And also joining us is uh, Bill Teal. He is the with the Kansas City Restaurant Association. So good morning to both of you. Thanks for joining us, Bill. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna find out how restaurants are taking it. I'm sure they're happy to be back and open for business. So we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But Dr. Shoemaker, just let's talk about you know this is the first. It's kind of like this is that time of year we remember when the pandemic hit two years ago. Um, this is feeling the most like normal that it has since pre-pandemic time. So yeah. what? What should people be keeping in mind? I mean, and we talk about super spreader events. It feels like that's something we discussed before the vaccine came along. What what kind of risks are out there? What do you want us to know? You know, I mean, we still have uh, COVID circulating as well as other respiratory viruses. So I think the biggest thing is ensuring that you are fully vaccinated, including your booster for COVID. On top of that, you need to make sure you have your seasonal influenza vaccination. Uh, and then pay attention to the local uh, county and municipal health department guidelines regarding masking and social distancing wherever you're at depending on what the local spread of the virus is. Uh, the other thing is practicing good hand hygiene. Um, you know, I mean, uh, that can't be overstated as well. I agree. Uh, Dr. Hawkinson, we talked a lot about super spreader events over the last couple yeah. of, of years and, and concerns that, that you would have when when these kind of events would come up. Um, are those a thing of the past, super spreader events? Yeah. Is it as scary as it sounds? Uh, I mean, I know you've been a big proponent of people enjoying their lives and mm -hmm. doing it safely and getting out and getting fresh yeah. air and sunshine, and this is kind of a way to do it. Yeah, I mean, super spreader events or super spreaders, you know, we do know and understand that really 80% of the infections in the spread is really taken by 20% of the people who may uh, reproduce and express more virus out of the community than others. and so. You know, super spread events, that, that's hard to say. I mean, are we talking about multi-day things? Are we talking about one event like a, uh, uh, you know, eating at a, um, uh, a reception or something like that or a concert? Um, I think as long as we can continue to have um, people, just as Dr. Shoemaker said, get vaccinated and be up to date with their vaccines, you know, this will certainly cut down on those super spreader events. And if we're talking about the short term, Again, hopefully we are going into warmer weather where people will be able to do things outside. You know, parades outside and celebrations outside are actually are really going to be much safer than inside. We always have to be on the lookout for those super spreader events. And more as an individual, you have to understand your risks about going to these things. You can always wear a mask even if they aren't mandated. Make sure that you are up to date on your vaccination and keep yourself safe. So I think we have to talk about the individual, but also the, the population and the community here in these cases. Bill Teal, I want to turn to you uh, again. Thank you for joining us today. Tell us some steps that restaurants are taking this time of year to get ready for the crowds. Well, I, when it comes to the virus, most restaurants have kept uh, a lot of their <clears throat> a lot of their uh, um, procedures in place, including the staff wearing masks in the front of the house and in the back of the house, uh, extra sanitation, in a lot of cases, disposable menus. So what we did at the beginning of the pandemic, we've continued uh, throughout the end of it, even though we masks are no longer required. How excited are businesses to be open and ready for the crowds? And again, feeling like things are somewhat back to normal. Well, it's, it's very exciting for everyone. And I, not just the restaurants, I think the customers, people are anxious to get out and, and celebrate St. Patrick's Day or basketball games or, uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo is coming up. Uh, the uh, consumers are, are ready to uh, get out and enjoy. It is. It's kind of the best time of the year. You're right. You know, 
the cold is lifting and everyone's out and gathering and being being able to just to be outside in the sunshine it, it, it's it's nice um what's just your one big message you want people to know heading out Mass, no mass, vaccinated, not vaccinated. We're all mixed in together. Just what would your message be on behalf of the restaurants? Well, I, I, I would tell everybody to, you know, to be careful. Uh, and I think this was discussed earlier about uh, each individual may have their own risks and their, their own um, problems that they have to deal with. So um, be comfortable in your restaurant. If, if you're not comfortable, don't stay. If, uh, if, uh, if they're doing the things that make you feel comfortable, then those are the restaurants you want to uh, 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 participate in. So um, I think the restaurants are doing the best they can, but it's up to the individuals too to, to feel safe when they go into restaurants. It really is. Restaurants have been a lot like schools. I think they've really done a good job. They've done the best they can mm -hmm. so that they can stay open and for business and, and keep people safe and keep people coming back. So with St. Patrick's Day and spring break uh, for many, it's this week and alcohol will be flowing. We want to talk about alcohol in the brain right now. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania find that the more alcohol drank, the more it ages your brain. They studied 36,000 people and found two drinks per day ages the brain up to two years. Three drink ages the brain up to more than up to three years. And the researchers found that those who had as many as four drinks per day deteriorated their brain health by four to five years. So that's why we brought a neurologist, Dr. Richard Dubinsky, to talk a little bit about that. Does that study hold true, hold up to what you know to be true about uh, brain and aging of the brain, doctor? Uh, yes, it does. Alcohol is well known to cause atrophy of the brain, uh, more so in certain areas, the frontal lobes, which are involved in uh, social interactions, uh, inhibition of behaviors, uh, and also the cerebellum, which is important for coordination. Uh, that's acute intoxication. Long-term use uh, does damage the brain. Some of that may be reversible. Some of it is not. That's, I, I want to ask more about that here in just a moment, but what's actually happening in the brain when we consume alcohol? And I think, I think we think of the brain as its own organ because we, we talk about the liver when it comes to drinking too much alcohol, but what is actually happening inside our brain? Uh, the alcohol promotes the formation of reactive oxygen species uh, that cause oxidative stress on the brain. Uh, it also releases some excitatory neurotransmitters that can damage the brain. Okay, so we hear things like a glass of wine a night can be good for the heart, but what might benefit one part of the body may be bad for another. Is, is it that one to two drinks a day thing still hold up? Is that something that we recommend being safe and okay? Uh, many of those earlier studies were flawed in that they combined uh, former drinkers with current abstainers, uh, and they may have overestimated the health benefits of alcohol. Uh, when studies more recently been done uh, on a more strict definition of uh, teetotalers versus those with daily consumption, uh, that health benefit disappears. So what is recommended? What would be, if you were talking to somebody, what would be the recommended amount of alcohol that would be safe without damaging the brain? Zero? Uh, probably close to zero. Okay. It's also important to remember that uh, this is from the British Biobank, so they used British definitions of a standard unit of alcohol, which is 10 mLs versus the U.S., which is 14. So it's basically uh, a half pint of beer versus a 12-ounce can of beer. So they drink more than us? Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. No, the, the British Brits are a bit stricter in terms of defining alcohol consumption. Uh, oh. So their drinks uh, that they're looking at are smaller than ours. That makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about reversing the effects of aging the brain. Um, it's gone once it's gone. It's gone. Is there anything we can do to repair any of it? Uh, physical activity and mental activity definitely can help uh, promote brain health. And uh, Dr. Jeff Burns at our Alzheimer's Center is, is working on many studies of that to try to forestall uh, the effects of aging and the onset of dementia. So what's some advice for better brain health uh, in general, St limiting alcohol for sure, but as far as good foods to eat, um, you, you mentioned exercise and just people doing crossword puddle puzzles and, and reading more as they age, do all those things help? Yes, they do. The Mediterranean diet uh, appears to show some benefit in terms of brain health as does physical and mental activity. All right, I'm gonna get to some community questions because they are coming in for our folks here today. Okay, Bill Teal, I have a question. Isaac wants to know, 
I know that when dining rooms initially closed, restaurants began taking, uh, selling takeout alcohol drinks. Are most uh, restaurants in Kansas City still doing that? People really liked that feature. Yeah, uh, most restaurants that that adopted that earlier are continuing to do it. Yes. Any concerns with that? Any advice regarding that? Besides, do not open um, it until you get home. No, no real concerns. Uh, we haven't seen any data that shows that it's uh, created any problems. Uh, there are safety features involved. Uh, you have to check an ID uh, to make sure that uh, whoever's picking up the alcohol to go is in fact uh, old enough. And so, so far it hasn't created any problems. You, do, you also have to buy food with your alcohol purchase. So there are some safety checks involved. Yeah, pretty well regulated. Gene wants to know, what are your comments, doctors, about the sewage data that's pointing to an increase in COVID and a possible warning of a spring wave here in the U.S.? Who wants to jump in first? Yeah, I mean, that was just recently reported based on wastewater data. Uh, it is concerning that there may be a, another surge coming mm -hmm. uh, that we haven't detected yet. We don't know if this is a different variant or if this is still just circulating Omicron. Uh, but it's something just to be on the lookout for. Again, if you to be protected against, I sound like a broken record, if you want to be protected against the next surge, make sure you're fully vaccinated, including your booster. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hawkinson, anything to add about a possible spring wave? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can emphasize that enough. You know, we are getting to this point now where people have had some vaccination, they've had infection, a combination that hopefully will, will add to overall our population and our community uh, in, uh, immune response or immunity, if you will, herd immunity, we've heard about that. Uh, but just as, as Dr. Shoemaker said, you know, we know and understand that in the past we have seen uh, in sampling of wastewater that an increase in the amount detected really uh, signals maybe two or three weeks down the road what we're going to be seeing with cases and hospitalizations. But I hope moving forward, just as Dr. Shoemaker said, that if everybody can be up to date with their vaccinations, we can really prevent a lot of those hospitalizations, hopefully much more than we prevented in this last surge. And really that is the goal of, um, of these vaccines, which they continue to do very well. Yeah. So we'll keep an eye on it. Um, and just to go back to that other question too, it really looks like the dominant strain around the world or variant continues to be Omicron. And then in some countries we do see BA2 or that offshoot of Omicron um, um, taking up some of that space for those, uh, those new infections as well. So right now, no other variants other than these Omicron variants that we've seen. A follow-up question to that was, are surges going to go away? Will they be called something else? Or is it just gonna be a continuation of surges? Or will that eventually, yeah. these high spike surges, mm -hmm. or will it be like a flu spike? You know, that's hard to say. You know, certainly the last two years we've seen that it doesn't really matter what season. We have seen uh, surges in every season, not really a seasonality like we have seen with influenza and other respiratory viruses. We may get to that eventually. Um, I don't think anybody has a crystal ball. Uh, crystal ball. So um, I think that really remains to be seen. And if we are talking about surges in cases, that's one thing different than surges in hospitalizations. Again, the main goal is to continue to prevent people from those who, especially who are at high risk of severe disease, from getting that high risk disease by getting uh, those vaccines so that they can stay home, stay out of the hospital, get well. And I think it's really hard to tell right now, um, don't have a crystal ball. Eventually, hopefully, maybe it will get to more of a seasonality. We know there will be some background level of infection all throughout the year, um, but mostly about people's behavior. If we're talking about that, where we are doing things outside in the warm months and going back inside and having more contact with everybody on the, uh, in the winter and colder months, we may start to see some seasonality um, towards this as well. Jennifer wants to know, Dr. Dubinsky, how do I know if I need to see a neurologist? What signs would I look for? Or, and what signs might I look for maybe in a parent that needs to be addressed? Well, that's a wide open question. For adults, it would be any sort of a loss of thinking abilities, also development of uh, new headaches perhaps, or signs of a stroke such as weakness. Uh, for a child, it would be if they're failing in school or not doing as well as they should. Really? Okay, so uh, yeah, for a child, what about like headaches, sleeping issues? I mean, I feel like there's so many different signs that we look for, and especially as a parent, you're constantly looking for signs in your kids and making sure that they're healthy. 
Um, what do you do if you have headaches? I'd suggest starting with your primary care provider first. Uh, 90% of the population gets headaches, so it's very mm-hmm. common. And uh, a healthcare provider is probably in a better position to decide whether it's a, a headache to be worried about or not. Dr. Shoemaker, uh, similar to what Dr. Hawkinson was talking about, but Anne wants to know just where do you think the future of, of COVID is going mm-hmm. based on information that you're following today versus maybe what we saw six months ago or 18 months ago? Um, just your take on, on that of what, what we think we're going to see and, um, you know, when we see the zero numbers up there, I think people are commenting on, well, we see numbers up on the screen. Are we going to see that again? Um, I mean, uh, as Dr. Hawkinson said, we, we don't have a crystal ball on this. I mean, this is obviously a once in a lifetime event for people in our specialty. Um, there's been mm-hmm. continued ongoing spread over the last two years. Uh, and although we're trending down currently, you know, we're still trying to ensure that we can get uh, enough population immunity that we can stop seeing the e- emergence of uh, variants and particularly severe disease. Now, as people continue to get vaccinated and or infected, they're going to have some antibodies that's, that are going to protect them, so they're going to be less likely to get severe disease. But we continue to see recurrent and breakthrough infections causing milder uh, disease. Um, and as Dr. Hawkinson pointed out, you know, we can only hope that at some point this turns into a, a seasonal viral respiratory pathogen instead of ongoing spread. Question. Oh, do you have something to add, Dr. Say, you know, and again, I think we also have to be um, uh, un- understand, too, that, that our experience here in the United States is much different than places around the world. We know other places around the world still are being devastated by that a lot because of lack of being able to get the vaccine. And so I think it's going to be important moving forward for all of us, even here, because we know we are just one plane flight away from really anywhere in the world, to continue to help and, and promote health and vaccination in those countries and get those supplies of vaccines to those countries that are less fortunate as well. Joelle, Joellen has a question and a comment. Setting politics aside, she says, my heart goes out to the millions of refugees yeah. who have no access to medical care. Yeah. Long term, what does how does this affect what does that affect have on global health care in general? Just anything you can comment yeah. about what we're seeing? I mean, I think anytime you have a refugee mm-hmm. crisis and you're, you're putting a lot of people together mm-hmm. in, in probably substandard conditions because some of the refugee uh, camps that may pop up are, are, have to be constructed in short order. Uh, and you have to worry about overcrowding of people. You have to worry about sanitation issues and food safety. Uh, and we've seen this, you know, repeat itself throughout history, outbreaks of, of neglected or rare diseases in these situations. So, yes, it is concerning. Um, I think this, in this setting, we're seeing a lot of uh, these displaced people going to urban areas where they're able to stay with other people. Uh, but we don't know what long term this is going to impact, especially the people that are still uh, stranded in, in conflict zones. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it has, it, just as Dr. Schumacher said, has major implications. Uh, you know, we're obviously the Ukraine is on the forefoot, uh, forefront of everybody's mind, but we've had other um, uh, conflict zones and, and refugees. You know, we know Syria, we know a lot of uh, several countries in Africa as well. Um, these all do have detrimental effects on global health, really. Uh, it's health in those local mu- communities, but also global health as well. And we know we have seen decrease in vaccination program rates. We've seen increase in other diseases that have been otherwise controlled by public health and by vaccination. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't take much for these diseases then to go from those areas to spread out around the world either, especially if you have refugees going from one country to another. So it's very important to do what we can to get those infrastructures to try and bring that public health and that medical treatment to those populations really to keep them healthy because we know that when people and communities are healthier, their production is much better, everything is improved as well. And so, uh, you know, that will be something to strive for. Hey, Bill, Amy wants to know, what's the biggest difference between this year's celebration and last year's celebration? Were we seeing big crowds last year? Were there concerns back then? There were still a lot of concerns uh, last year. Uh, was celebration not as big as we're anticipating this year um particularly with a little bit warmer weather nicer weather so uh, i think there'll be bigger crowds in a bigger celebration this year i mean is it fair to say bill that it's just back to normal 
Do I dare say the word normal? Uh, I think as close to normal as we can be right now. Uh, it, it's not going to be more than normal, but approaching normal from the from the restaurant side, and and I think from the consumer side, they want to be able to celebrate uh, things like St. Patrick's Day. Well, I think restaurants have you know kind of given us that they've been that thing that makes us feel as normal as possible. Who knew that you know we all go to restaurants? We've talked about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just run out and go to restaurants any old time you want, and then when this hit, it just made you appreciate so much more the ability to go sit on a patio somewhere and and visit with friends and, and now doing it safely. Uh, that's gonna wrap up our questions today. So I do wanna get to final thoughts from our guests and uh, Dr. Shoemaker, I'm just gonna start with you. Just final thoughts, what do you want us to know? Uh, I mean, you know, if you haven't been vaccinated, be sure to get vaccinated, including your booster, not just for COVID, but for influenza. You know, we're right at the tail end of influenza season. Uh, so mm -hmm. don't forget about the preventative measures. Can't say it enough. Dr. Dubinsky, just thoughts about binge drinking and, and keeping our brains um, and putting our brains first when it comes to uh, out there partying. This, this uh, binge drinking is never good. <laughs> uh, alcohol mm -hmm. in moderation and not every day. That's fair. Okay. I'd like, I'd like to just note, I'm loving this bow tie thing. Not every person, yeah. not every man can pull off a bow tie. You go. Uh, thank you. You're, thank you're you. both <laughs> doing it. You're both doing it very well. And where is yours, Dr. Hawkinson? I'm not a man, I guess. I can't, I can't pull it off. Hey, you said it. All right. Final thoughts. And then we're going to go to uh, Bill. Um, I, I don't think we can overemphasize Dr. Shoemaker's points. You know, preventive care is about what best, whether we are talking about getting to your preventive care and your preventive screening for cancer, or especially in our uh, line of work, preventive care for those vaccine preventable diseases. It is so important to stay up to date with your vaccinations, whether that is COVID vaccination, which you should be up to date, that will help protect you from any other further surge, but it's other things like the tetanus vaccine, which also has a component of whooping cough in it. And if we are adults and grand, uh, parents and grandparents, we know that we lose our immunity to whooping cough. And so getting that Tdap booster is going to help protect us from giving it to our young children or our newborn babies. Um, it's the other vaccines, influenza. Just make sure you're talking with your medical professionals so that you can stay up to date with those to help protect you and reduce your risk from that serious disease and serious side effects of those diseases, which we know can be readily prevented with those vaccines. Bill Till, thank you so much for being with us today and just reminding us to stay safe and, and enjoy life and get back to that, you know, the new normal. Just your final message as folks head out to uh, enjoy this week. Well, my, my final message would be let's all celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but let's celebrate in moderation. Um, don't overindulge. Uh, let's all have a good time and let's keep working to get back to normal. Well said. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. March 30th is National Doctors Day. And here is a way to say thank you to all healthcare workers. Many of you have asked, how do we show our gratitude for everything that our staff does? On your screen right there is a QR code. So you can do just that. You can thank a healthcare provider. Just open your camera on your phone and you can just hover over that QR code. It's gonna take you to your email. You can send a nice note or a 30 second video. And we are gonna share those right here on the Morning Medical Update. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget you can catch our shows anytime on Facebook, YouTube, and now on Twitter. Coming up tomorrow, there's a new leader at the helm of the Kansas City Health Department. Dr. Marvia Jones joins us. The changes she plans to make to help those who are underserved and underinsured. That's tomorrow on Open Mics with Dr. Stites at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.